Okay. Hello, everyone. I hope my voice is loud and clear. And uh, I'm going to begin tonight's talk. Um, unfortunately, I can't speak louder than this. Hopefully, you can hear me well. The title of tonight's episode is Meditations on Social Phenomena, and so Mr. Within would be speaking about, in some sense, the evolution of society and how the mind of man, in some sense, has a sort of phenomena to acknowledge. You can say that life is pretty much an activity, where in this activity you're finding a moment of existence with various levels of intensities of experience. You see, we say you have your personal experience. We tend to acknowledge each other as individuals. However, our individuality has its limits and the limit of our individuality is our collectivity. Our collectivity is our collective evolution. It is how the mind of man decided to live and evolve no longer alone. And so from loneliness, we have stepped into civilization once again as the eyes of the new generations. What I mean by this is that society is a phenomenon. Everything is a natural phenomenon. However, a part of nature has managed to somehow have an unnatural or uncommon level of intelligence in comparison to other species. You see, we can say a lion is more intelligent than an insect, but we say a human being is more intelligent than a lion. Does that make lions insects to human beings? And so what I mean by that is that it's different designs, different formats, as if life was not just one program, it was many programs allowed authorization of expression. Something very fascinating came into my attention, especially today. I pinpointed something that I was trying to figure out for many years. I was trying to understand rage and anger, and I was trying to understand why the human being gets upset from the external reality. And then I realized it's because of certain expectations it has. Uh, you cannot get upset unless you have an expectation. And because the human being has certain expectations, it is in some sense internally projecting the life that it is waiting to happen. And that internal life, that inner phenomena, either can be manifest or not. And so this is, I think, the modern uh, approach towards success where the person just gets a vision of success and does not think about the vision afterwards. It becomes one of those things that, that rather than this kind of what's a community called the new age community telling people to endlessly do affirmations and law of attraction and all that. Let me tell you, the only thing law of attraction books attract you are law of attraction books. <laughs> it's like, and the moment somebody says there's a secret, every people will endlessly pay to find out that secret. And that is the flaw of the human design. We worship the unknown at the edge of our knowledge. And it's not per se a flaw, it's just a kind of texture. Some things in this life, it's kind of like an exam, a mathematics exam. Uh, the, the solution is given. Uh, sorry, the problem is given. The solution is unknown. You see, it's as if there is a certain domain, a certain range of uh, reality and data, sensory data given, yet there are unknown factors still influencing the equation. That means whatever equation we find humanity have, it will have a plus X on the side. And what I mean by that is that it has plus the unknown, the infinite unknown, perhaps. That means infinity plus one is still infinity, but that plus one has an implication. 
as if it's a new type of infinity, a new reference towards the approach of the infinite. There's a saying by Rumi, he says, out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there is a place, I will meet you there. When I heard that quote, I instantly knew what he was talking about. This place is the place of the placeless. It is, it is a state of mind rather than, it's as if like after all the external locations that are a sort of location, a sort of experience of locality, one can, says there is, can say their inner dimensions are an experience of locality. What that means is it is very hard for us to distinguish whether consciousness has elemental roots it's root it's rooted in elemental existence or elemental existence is si simply the speaker where this melody is being played from You see, when we look at it from a historic uh, standpoint, we see a long progression of uh, nature. And what really existence is, is it's, it is in, on some level a sequencing of events. This is why the whole simulation theory can be entertained because life is, is, is like a program uh, pre-written. You know, it's as if the DNA has its shape and so does the cosmos one thinks. By the, way, by the way, anyone tuning in, if it's your first time tuning in, you can always in the chat section um, share ideas that we can all kind of like, all scope into them if you like. <clears throat> but I'm, what I'm trying to say is that natural phenomena through evolution and through something that Mr. Within calls, uh, I tend to acknowledge it, I find the world doesn't. But I acknowledge a sort of subjective evolution that took place, and this subjective evolution was simultaneous. It was simultaneous the moment the objective evolution took place, same way as the caterpillar, its last cell dies and the cell of the butterfly emerges. What that means is the last biologically designed cell of the caterpillar fades, but the energy of that cell is still there. On some, there's there's a, a, a kind of unspeakable energetic presence to phenomena. It's like when they say energy cannot be created and destroyed. When you realize you are conscious energy or this energetic phenomena that's conscious of itself, you kind of get a sense that the primacy, the 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 primordial kind of energetic position of the cosmos no, doesn't change. That means it's like it's kind of like how can i say it we man is not just it's not that god just told man that man was made in the reflection of god uh, also the world is made in the reflection of man and what that means is when we go try to figure out what our uh, uh grand role is in this cosmic uh, scheme we realize the human being is primarily um, um, a creature that is, how can I tell you, it's like a field of intelligence is choosing to function particularly. And it's as if we are the fingers of the cosmos, or better yet, I could say, we are the eyes of the cosmos. Because if I, if Mr. Within was to ask you, who are you? You know, before you learned language, you will see you are the unknown witnessing presence. That is the true remainder. That is something that the modern world is running away from because they associate death to non-existence. Let me tell you, on some level, everything I'm saying doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter. That means it doesn't matter what I say or not. Nature's voice is much louder than mine personally. However, if I have heard nature's voice, if I have heard it, it, how can I tell you? It's like, what if I told you a part of the enlightenment was to not exist subjectively? What if I told you your subjective uh, certain ideas are puppeteering your destiny? 
And if those ideas changed, if the sequencing, if, if your attention was freed somehow from thought, how would the intelligence function? Social phenomena means it's like it's ancient, guys. Nothing is kind of new. It's like things happen in new ways, but it's like the phenomena is not new. So you see, it all has to do with the dimensions that we acknowledge the self and the dimensions of the self seem to be limited into the domain of language where we specialize into being a certain character in a story. When you realize you're a character in a story and you are the one painting the story into meaning and color, it's one of those things where you have to realize the truth of life is not per se something you have to find. Like, holy shit, you don't have time. The hourglass sands in the hourglass are, are falling. You know, run and find truth before you die. Like, it's not, it's not one of those kind of situations. It's more, this is what Mr. Within is saying. You are literally sitting at this giant dinner table where 8 billion people are sitting at this dinner table. And suddenly, one of these people says something that is so rude that all the other people from across the table, they for a second get shocked. And it's one of those things where I want to kind of say, we are being torn apart as thoughts in society. We are being torn apart between the natural impulse to playfully coexist. And we are uh, in some sense, um, kind of breaking in the middle of also this impulse where, let me tell you, it's like a part of your mind is an ally of chaos, a part of your mind is an ally of order. And if you're a person who uses the word good and bad, that means there's two senses of self in one moment. That means literally your psyche is fragmented between good and bad. This is why Zen masters, they don't have guilt that much. They ask him, yo man, don't you have guilt? And the guy's like, bro, guilt had me, I let it go. <laughs> and so like what it means is that it's one of those situations where you are getting defined phenomenologically. Phenomena like how would I say it? Like you are conscious phenomena changing all the time. Okay, that is who we are. Now, how far that goes, how far these living human beings are willing to see various kinds of world changing worlds in front of their eyes and still remain true to how the nature of the attention is present. You see, there are some teachings you have, you are in this life to learn from personalities. Literally, if you're a social creature, a huge part of your destiny requires observing people. And as you observe people, you learn from yourself. This can be said to be the, uh, the extrovert mentality as Mr. Within sees it. So the extrovert is one who needs the world. That is why he's running into it easily. And the introvert is one who needs the inner world. You see, it's like one is directed to the external world, the other is directed to the inner world. And just to clear this up, guys, this is how simply I'm saying, saying this. I'm saying literally we before we learn language and anything, like what is it? What do we see in like right now as I'm speaking to you, who is speaking to you? Well, we see there's a biological physical body, but then there's this voice and this voice that has a mind which somehow randomly and uniquely is bringing about these words. So this mind, is, it's as if the moment has an objective component, then in accordance to the subjectivity, which is the effect of the unknown cause of the mind and your unconscious, that is when that is when reality gets meaning. You find different senses of self. Like this is something nobody said ever, but I'll say it. <laughs> and that is that your guardian angels are your future selves. They are, it's as if we are the thoughts of a God that we already are which in some sense means divine emptiness. Divine emptiness means even God doesn't know what's behind that. You know, <laughs> the divine is like, yo, oh, that's too empty to go. It's like literally if you were an angel, like you saw a human being in distress, you would be like, okay, wait a minute. 
all right am i seeing the human <laughs> It's like, does this human being need saving or do I need to save myself from the idea that reality has to be imposed through a sort of ideological position? That is the thing. There is, it's like we are self-obsessed, language-oriented creatures and then we are find ourselves in the world and we have to communicate. And to be honest, I don't know. I honestly, I am like some dude in his ivory tower looking at some, like as, as much as the world allows his eyes to see. But what I'm seeing when what I'm noticing is that language is reaching an apocalyptic point and there is nobody doing anything about it. There is nobody help in saying anything. There is a subjective extinction literally approaching. Literally, it's like you're in it. It's like literally we are in some sense being trapped by the past to not see the future we're actually walking in. Do you see? How words and language is the only technology we have to explore the unconscious. The greatest technology we tool we have. But at the same time, this technology is also the chains that hold the titan's power. It's as if only when the titan was chained, that's when the chains could break. Only when reality was clothed in suffering, you could just take the suffering off and experience the deeper dimensions of, that this world doesn't have to offer, but it's just, it's here. So one can say that if meditation is the idea that a human being can have their attention on a single point, Pretty much meditation is another way of saying uh, the fruits of concentration. And how would I say it to you? It's like when you meditate on society, you're meditating on a giant coagulation, literally a bundle of different intelligent systems uh, emerging. So what I see is like, guys, let me tell you, news is not just on TV. Anytime you see a person, if you're attentive, you will notice how that person has changed. It took me a while, but I found a way of being present where I could instantly tell if somebody was being themselves or not simply because I had, I had fought, I had, I had, I had been through some battles with language. That means it's as if like, you know, a man is not just some guy who holds a sword. A man is an effort for humanity's continuity, which means eventually your pride of the future of your species gives you a strength that makes all the individual suffering you think the world is throwing on you as not as dust on your shoulder, which you instantly brush off and attend the next command. That is life. It's as if like the video game has been turned on when you open your eyes in the day. This video game, you're in it. It has various dimensions. You can attain various experiences. There is uh, different levels. There's different challenges. There, in some sense, it literally like in economical structure, it has different bosses, you know? On some level, you will see that the world is a game of language and you will laugh. You will literally laugh probably, probably more, more than like, three minutes definitely you will laugh more than three minutes <laughs> when you realize how much the world is existing subjectively so you have to realize even me speaking right now i am imposing subjectivity upon the moment where there is objectivity and pure silence and when you realize that sound and the voice they arise from the silence of the world and that means the personality anything kept in the domain of language any sense of branch of knowledge that is linguistic in it instantly it begins evaporate uh, um, uh, dematerializing out of conception there was this great poet by the name of Ferdowsi this ancient Persian poet I say ancient but you know what I mean like <laughs> and so this poet by the name of Ferdowsi in, in his great kind of mythological writings for true Persian culture to some degree, or what could be preserved of Persian culture. <clears throat> Persian culture is something that uh, the most easiest way to get access of it is to a museum because it died a long time ago. <sighs> 
It died when people forgot who they were, forgot their land, forgot their unity, and they separated. The story of the world from the separation to the singular, from the singular to the separate. It's as if I'm telling you, your mind is a multidimensional phenomena. Sound from silence arises, noise. What that means is literally like before I say anything, before you hear me say a word, it's like right here, I'll try this right. Right now, if I was to say a golden apple in the, in, in the sky, your mind would instantly have an image for that. Imagine a golden apple in the sky. And this imagination, it arose from nowhere. That means literally um, like a couple moments ago, this thought was not in this space. It emerged in this state, space. That means from the silence came noise. It's like if from a complete nothingness, something began moving. Okay? We have to do this because personalities are limited. Therefore, we have to. Literally, our ego is based on a program that has to acknowledge emptiness to know where its edge is. Anyways, this Ferdosi, I just remembered. Ferdosi, he had this thing where he he wrote about this myth, myth like myth, like mythic level kind of mythological level um, archer named Arash Kamongir, Arash the Archer, and Arash an archer in mythology. Just just look at how badass this archer was. This archer was known that he said when he really wanted to. Uh, shoot an enemy it's as if his arrow he would shoot that enemy in with an arrow where when the arrow hit the enemy it was as if the enemy had never existed that means it's as if this archer had was like had reached a level of archery where one shot it was instantaneous kind of uh, eradication of the being now the whole way the philosopher wrote it it's as if like check out his poetry he says uh the uh, the arrow it's a, like as if the if the arrow hit the guy it's as if the guy never existed do you see it's like that much of a knockout <laughs> and so what i'm saying is what this is suggesting is that rather than us basing our intelligence based on a sort of rubric of intelligence based on various multidimensional structures, you know, rather than fragmenting intelligence, we must realize the value of its un unification. Now, the value of its unification can be chaotic, guys. Don't think love. All these people who are like, love, 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 you know, it's like, I understand love. It is so important. It is the divine opening into greater realms of being. But The limitless moves behind your eyes. Did you not know? The nameless of the cos eyes of the cosmos for the first time have named themselves. We have let language, allowed language to live in our minds. And we have learned to worship language. And I have, in some sense, this kind of incredible approach to what happened in history. And this is why Mr. Within is roaring in the streets of mankind. We are in an era of ideal worship. And I don't, I am shocked how long this ideal worship has gone. It's as if certain language came and possessed man for its own purpose. But its purpose was limited to how well man created it. 
So it's as if the inventor created a ship to go towards the sky, but based on how well he made the ship depends his karma. Based on how every moment was approached and the designer within, uh, in some sense, roared out. Because there's a way you can look at this life that it is in some sense just purely designed. And that's, it's hilarious. That's the best way. That's the best way because I kind of notice it. I'm like, what is happening in Western society in the subconscious psyche of the good person? I just went, all right, I'm like, okay, this is, there's a society here. There's social phenomena here. Let me see how it happened. And as I, I looked at it, I began to see there was no control. It was as if like a bunch of animals started wearing clothing. It's like, wow, well, what else do you expect? <laughs> it's like, what else can you say? You know, it's like I honor my ancestors, but I dare not walk their same roads. Because they have lived it. It's as if the intelligence of your DNA, is, it harbors creativity. We don't understand, but to be honest, human beings, they're not here to outskill one another in mechanical intelligence. In like competitive hierarchical thing. That's just waste of time, guys, I'm telling you. The mind of the human being, the human being, it, had, it, was, it was said by ancient texts, especially in Vedic culture, that the purpose of human existence was to work. W-O-R-K. Okay? That means literally you have entered this world not to just watch it. You have entered it to get involved in it. But now how much you choose to get involved, here is the thought. Here's the thought that I actually added today, which I want to kind of integrate it into this talk. The thought was that a person can, whether they fail a bunch of times, or whether they succeed a bunch of times, or whatever variation, after repetitive attempts, they will get a sense of how much they truly are willing to live for whatever that activity, that intention is. Some things, it's like the intentions of like, the guy wants to go like, you know, uh, lie down on clouds, but earth is calling him down to come and build like a building or something, you know <laughs> The cosmos Is how your intelligence your known intelligence dances with the unknown every day eventually will become the explorers domain So it's as if you are not a true human being unless you care about some quality of humanhood Okay I want you to imagine like whether we had in the future like extraterrestrial citizenship on this planet or whether in the future we had robotic intelligence attaining kind of digital citizenship, you know. There is something valuable in the moment. And it is that regardless of what kind of Whatever your environment says, there is something here that is you. And this you, Mr. Within, is just saying it's not language. That's my main point. And it's, it's, I, I have to approach it from so many angles. Because let me tell you, I realize I don't know anything. And that's when I realize why we should know. Why humanity must attempt its greater possibility or why the hell does it exist? Like why like to be honest, why are human beings here? Are we here to just be cruel to one another? Like is that is that what evolution wanted? Like, you know? It's it's so easy, by the way, to not give the world meaning. It's like as they say, to me it's like some things like imagine if you we follow the idea that you you shouldn't find truth, you should create truth. Now we go wonder, it's like, okay, what does that mean, create truth, you know? <laughs> and that means is you realize life is a creation of truth. Literally, it's like in ancient tr mythical traditions, there were cities on the giant backs of these turtles, these giant turtles, you know? And so what that implies is that the world is alive, but we are living in a lifeless way in, as, as life. We have disconnected from what nature had blessed us with. And that was union. Union and abidance. Because that, well, that's what happens. Like I'm not, I'm not saying everybody should go and hug a tree. But I'm saying if you see a tree, wonder how long will it be until that's being taught in history books. We must not forget that there are certain colors we must really 
in some sense fight to keep. The mind of man, the moment it sees itself in a dimension, it can play with that dimension. Any dimension you are superior, beyond, you observe. That's the truth. Okay? This is why when you observe your thoughts, your thoughts aren't the only truth because they come and go. Like Zen masters, these dudes were wise. They said your thoughts are like leaves on a tree. Your beliefs are like leaves on a tree. You know? And as the seasons pass, they change the texture, the nature, the reality, the emergence of the view. Your eyes have a meaning, yet that meaning, how does it open up? If you, scientists are kind of saying something like we're using like 12% of our brain or something, okay? So if that is the case, even though I feel that's not like there's, there's nothing, like that's a wrong theory, but I feel like if it was true, how would the solution be? And the solution w would be is that it's not a person, it's not a personality that evolves into a greater realm. Albert Einstein gave us a divine clue towards solving the problem of the universe. He said no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. That means the way you saw the problem and how the world was real in that moment, literally where the solution is, is if the, if the world is real in beyond that, you have to see something new for there to be new movement. This is why mastery back in the day, people had honor because imagine the world was like this kind of enlightened school at first. People in ancient times, they were not just students, embodied beings and just students of like, let's say the school of Athens or something. It's like little did the architect of the school of Athens know how many ideas will be born in that objective structure. The mind of man is so fascinating. We, the, our humanity is so boring. Our, 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 the story we tell ourselves of what is real is so boring. I'm telling you it's boring. The fact that everything's going to nothing is boring. So what? So what that emptiness uh, has been acknowledged before you die? So what? What happens is you realize you have nowhere to go and then you stop being an egoic thought, egoic being. When you stop being an egoic being, something strange happens. You have to trust your experience rather than bog yourself down in a certain bunker of thought. I have often said there is a war of language going on. This war, I say that we are in the trenches. Right now, me and you, I'm speaking to you in the trenches of this war you do not see because it has to do with how language is fighting for people's attention. There, it's like, let me tell you, something that could be equivalent to an extraterrestrial invasion. Uh, I call it ideological possession. That means literally you are possessed by an idea to believe that idea is the only truth rather than expanding your eyes experientially, you indirectly close them. In boxes of words that could never capture the real world and isn't that the essence of poetry? It's like, like this is true poetry where this is like how you know somebody was a poet where on their deathbed, their last words is, bring me paper, I want to write something. And then the guy fades. What he means is that the world is waiting for itself. It is waiting for the average human being to say, what, how am I saying the average? How am I even choosing to hold a structure? You have to attempt knowledge. It's kind of like martial arts. Education at its core, is the it's like rather than martial arts schools becoming more like academies academies should become like martial arts schools because there has to be the same intensity that means it's as if like if you saw a zen master and you let's say you saw harvey dent harvey dent from
Imagine like Harvey Dent saw an enlightened Zen monk and he looks at Mike and he says, from the show Suits, he looks at Mike and he says, let's go, this guy doesn't even believe we're here. <laughs> Clarity, that is the greatest teacher. I feel the street smart souls of this world see this. Those who have trusted the world immensely, the world will trust them. Sometimes your karma is not a relationship with you in an empty room of matter. It's really with you in, in uh, like the empty room of matter is here, but there is your mind's room. There is where imagination lives and memory kind of projects. And in some sense, how your attention can be navigated because uh, at its core, your attention is attributeless. When you understand this, dear listener, me and you, like I will literally, like I'm, I'm like kind of like floating on these clouds and I'm like, yo, <laughs> beyond thought, direct experience knows. Because we're all shaking up a system and the social phenomena is fascinating. The more it goes towards freedom, the more there's going to be anarchy, but then the solution to that anarchy will be innovation. So it's as if those people who made mistakes, they have their destiny is taking them to making the right decision. And those people who've made the right decision is to suddenly see how the right decision was a mistake. And what that means is you begin to see the hollowness of the dualistic projection. That's pretty much the wheel of karma. So the concept, guys, you know how you get out of karma? When the concept never existed. <laughs> That's the simplest way, because that is the truth of it. The mind is so advanced. You don't understand how advanced your mind is. We are so crowd caught by the day's activities that we never wonder what is actually active here. And so when you observe the states of your intelligence, eventually you surpass from the personality domain to the presence domain. And when you're in the presence domain, it's as if it doesn't matter where you are, whoever you are, wherever you are in society, outside of society, but let's say in, in a busy marketplace even, whoever you are, it's as if there is no there is no fear because there is no longer an idea of you as if some, somehow your intelligence understood that it was the puppeteer of its own strings. That's, that's the existential responsibility. Independence cannot arise unless there is freedom behind your eyes. The world is, the story of the world for now is like pretty much this, a bunch of com confused creatures who don't know how to manage the resources of the globe, of, of, of the planet are caught in incredible language games and somehow life is moving on. So what it really means is that human beings, because they have wanted their desires, they have sacrificed the discipline required to maintain the previous realities. This is the issue with desire. It makes you forget where you came from. That's the issue with desire. That is the di issue because the person only is thinking of themselves. Let me tell you, it's kind of like a fear tactic of the ego. Like how would I speak about the ego? I will tell you it's like, on, on some manner, it's like a box a person makes and puts on their head. That's the ego, pretty much. And when that box comes off, the person is there as the, as the presence of the moment, and you cannot lie. Literally, you cannot, you cannot even see God if you, in some sense, are considering sight can hold God. Do you see? It's like an illusion and it's a fallacy, a paradoxical intent due to the desire. So this is the thing. It's like either the two worlds have to, in some sense, live, uh, coexist. Either the two worlds have to integrate or either the two worlds will go into some chaotic frenzy, not realizing indirectly they're also integrating. So what that means is like, it's all about levels of activity. And when we come and become a civilization, I call this it like right now, we're not even civilization 1.0, but I'm talking about civilization 2.0. <laughs>
Civilization 2.0 is a civilization that has realized the ultimate resource is not monetary, financial, or uh, economical. It's as if the survival of the person is not just based on their biological existence, but it is in how far their subjective inspiration opened their eyes while they were alive. And that is it. There is no life purpose. To be honest, biologically, the purpose of life is you're just evolutionary, evolved this, the, to this degree, and so you just experience it. So to be honest, nature, you ask nature a question, its answer is silent. You know, all those people who in some sense say that they speak to like spirits of nature, I'm telling you that is a, I'm, I'm sorry, but that is a romance. <laughs> that is like, um, falling in love with the self you see in others which is the others you still don't know maybe that sentence was like too like i saw three dimensions to it but anyway What do we value as existential beings? Mr. Within finds it's truly our personal experience. Once our personal experience has reached a sort of maintainable level, it becomes uh, our impersonal experience, which includes the domains of various ways we see other people. You see, to be honest, on some level, every person you see, you're, you're getting an impression of them but you can say, it's like, let's say the first time you meet someone, that's like the first impression. That's like the first layer of who that person has communicated to be. But when you see how complex you are as a being, like if you are a person who it takes a long time to get to know, then you are a very complex being. So if you see that same complexity, you can also see that same com complex psychology in the other. What that means is it's not like you can just see something good happening for you happening for others. You can also see like some, someone else's suffering can for a moment become your suffering. And so this is why you must care for clarity. It's as if this is kind of like the, al the divine alpha um, psychology. What I mean by that is like the person is acknowledging a multidimensional reality Therefore, because they're aware of two worlds at once, they have to appear ceremonial. What comes across as ceremonial and ritual was just the physical effect of a collective phenomenon behind a veil. Like I'm telling you, it, our psychologies are incredibly fascinating because reg regardless of what our like ancestors did, it, our existence is from scratch. <laughs> so what I mean by that is that a child opens its eyes and its mind is being its world at first. The child literally, you speak to a super young child, the child just like, it just knows something is there and maybe like expresses, but it doesn't have external attention uh, or uh, oriented yet. The child eventually begins, so here's the thing. The mind, just let's say, I forget child, just imagine a human being born, that mind is being the world, so it is creating a subjective world, you know? So from the objective world has come a reflection, a subjective reflection of an inner world, okay? So this subjective world now the child can choose, the free will can choose to, in some sense,
from the subjective world comes the subjective self. Once the subjective self fully emerges, the objective self is completely owned by the thought. The thought owns the body as if your body doesn't belong to nature. So then you become this kind of living idea of yourself. But eventually you see it's just subjective phenomena's implication. That means I say like right now, think of it this way. Um, they say that when a person sleeps, literally their brain gives different sort of waves. Okay, so right now your brain, it, it's like some energetic expression that's given off waves. Okay, so we can say just like how a person doesn't see Wi-Fi, you know, Wi-Fi waves in there. So similarly, the person knows there are deeper dimensions where waves are occurring, even though he does not see the waves. So this is how you enter the unconscious. This is in some sense how the unconscious is the unknown. That means this is when uh, pretty much in mythology it was like in the flat earth image, it was like the ship moving at the edge of the ocean uh, of that flat earth and kind of like hovering in space and, and going eternally. Right, so it's kind of like that sort of attempt at wondering how the unknown sculpts knowledge and how knowledge is sculpting what the unknown means. And all of this is important because these, these questions, it's like right now, it's not the era of quest. Like, to be honest, in an era of idea worship, you shouldn't be looking for solutions from anyone. You should be fascinated by ideology, but you should not, like, you know what I mean? You should not look for truth as if it's something outside of you. That is, that is the first flaw. That is when yourself has been chained to a sort of condition, your environment's kind of voice has entrapped who you really are. And so, <laughs> of course, these are just personal observations. I, I, I see that society is a evolving phenomena. Okay, so it's as if like you can say what are if, if like what are some examples of collective actual collective beings? We can say AI could be a digital collective being. That's one example. Another example of a collective being is how on some cellular level it's like we're all like made of atoms. You know, we're all made of cells. Do you see? It's like just there could be that sort of kind of collectivity or there could be the collectivity of one thought in the mind of many people. It's as if they ask some guy, where are we? And the guy, no, somebody asked this guy, he said, we're on earth right now. And somebody, the other guy looks up to him and he says, how do you know? And the guy means like, what do you know? What do you mean, bro? How do I know me and you are standing on the earth? And the guy says, how do you know? And the guy says, because I see it. And the guy says, how do you know you can see it? The guy looks at it and eventually comes to this conclusion that the unknown is ever present. That is the ultimate. That is the apocalypse hiding. It's as if knowledge is, a, is training. It's strange. The more technological we become, the more we value ideology. That means like the greatest contribution of the technological revolution was bringing forth an, an, an integrative platform of various minds. So what the internet is, is like a database of just various, like, like based on what is exposed to you online, it's like a um, sequencing of data. Okay, it's as if after some point, it doesn't matter what the person is saying, the concepts they're saying is just being a picture. You're literally seeing them paint a world. And how the words arise, how the sequencing arises, how the intelligence has acknowledged the presence of their moment. It's no longer a time to be spiritual. What is it? <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know, I think uh, spiritual societies um, uh, could be uh, foolish. And the reason is that you, you have to realize it's kind of like a chameleon kind of setting, or let me say it even a better way. Um, Marcus Aurelius said, Mark, <laughs> the 
the soul is dyed with the colors of its thoughts, with the color of its thoughts. That means literally your moment gains meaning in accordance to the where, where your attention lands on, whether it's internal or external. Sometimes you could be looking at like a cup, but behind your eyes thinking as if like, you know, uh, the curvature of that cup is kind of like, how can I say it? It's like the walls of that cup is like waterfalls and like, like, you know, some part of nature or something like the mind can, in some sense, uh, based on how, based on how much you trust the, the space where your mind is existing comes ability. Like there's a, there's a relationship there. I don't know how to say it exactly. Because eventually you see the motivation of action has to come from a character in a story being able to gain, get something, right? It's as if it's like we cannot just, uh, the ego is not something to also, it's a technology. Language is a technology. Mr. Ruthven is just saying, what do we do with it, right? And Mr. Ruthven, like how can I say it? Like I've said this thing where I, it's this concept I've kind of, uh, in some sense, through, through my own vision, in my own way, kind of uh, originated, that I could say that it's like, Simply, it's like a really common sense concept. It's the language threshold. And it's this idea I have where I say, literally, after some moment of experiencing life, you're going to realize there's a lot of experience in, experiences in the moment that cannot be put in language. Literally, you cannot write it, you know? Perhaps because you were kind of like stepping between worlds when you were. So what that means is the mind has a sort of acceleration, a sort of speed. It comes from your intention. Someone asked me, uh, like, what do you think of energy? And I'm like, this is the idea. If you feel something is important, you will instantly get the energy. The gods will instantly answer your prayers. If something is important. If you, if you, there's every moment has a sort of calling, a sort of pull, you know, intuitive pull. You can say it's like, the soul is how the thought of man is endlessly gravitating towards the void. It's all, in, on some sense, language being sequenced. On some level, I could truly understand that dude in the Matrix who was just looking at those codes and he could figure everything out. Because those codes would define the limits of what could happen and what could not. It would be the behavior of how the words were reflecting the world. And as the words changed, it was an implication the world had changed. And so when a lot of words move in the conscious moment, what occurs is like you got to see there's an orbit around you. Literally like how planets have an orbit, like the moon orbits around the planet. Like your ideas and beliefs and every thought and every other, your sensory data, it doesn't just come to you through like, I don't know, like direct light beam. You know, it, it, that direct light beam enters the intelligence. The intelligence is momentarily aware. The momentarily awareness appears as this endless spherical kind of moment. This endless spherical moment of wakeful existence suggests the presence of experience. The presence of experience is the instant kind of, it's kind of like the open door. You enter the realms of the kind of heavenly. And when you enter the realms of the heavenly, what that means is you have entered a moment where you trust the whole moment. And that trust means you trust how the mind moves. And it doesn't matter. It's like you, you won't be caring about truth, finding truth anymore because it has to do with how you attend your own intelligence to realize ultimately your, the greatest value of your life is in the life and the advancement of your species. And the simple argument for this is very easy. It's like, it's like the same thing they say in philosophy, like why not? This teacher in an exam wrote like a question, W-H-Y, like this bonus question. And a lot of the kids answered, eventually they came to the teacher and uh, the teacher said, this one kid got it right. The uh, teacher told the kid, all right, what was your answer, you know? And the kid stands up and says in class, he says, the answer to this question, philosophical question, why, question mark, was why not, question mark. And that why not is a suggestion of, whoa, the other is accessible. The instantaneity, the instantaneity of ability is accessible. It's like that inner psychological authorization occurs and then how can I say it? It's like, <clears throat> you, 
you evolve from the student teaching a teacher dynamic to becoming a student of how your mind receives life. Just a second, guys.
Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that intermission. Let's continue. A sentence came to my mind. The love of God is the death of truth. Yeah, I think it was the love of God, the death of the truth. Anyways, the, what I'm trying to say is that we have to treat it like artists when it comes to what the, how the unknown emerges into the conscious mind. Civilization must begin realizing that if it doesn't have the strength to change the old world, the new world is the permission of a new dimension. That means we got to start treating civilization as one global community. This global community is like the global brain. This global brain means that different people in different cultures are acting and in different professions are acting as different parts of this global brain that we're all part of. But this global brain is very uniquely looking at the kind of sub subjective value of biological nature. We are kind of like the eyes of nature that in some sense uh, uh, cannot let go of ourselves, you know? The story of humanity is the attention to the character that's being there. Because to be honest, if we were to speak about what freedom is right now, but this is a good thing, let me try this. I'm gonna Google quotes on freedom and literally see what the world ha can say, what the digital universe has to say. Just hold on guys. Here. I'm just going to read the quotes one by one from these random people. The theme of the quote is freedom. So let's go into a quote tunnel right now. Sometimes I have these in, in these live streams. Today I choose life. Every morning when I wake up I can choose joy, happiness, negativity, pain. To feel the freedom that comes from being able to continue to make mistakes and choices. Today I choose to feel life. Not to deny my humanity but embrace it. Kevin O'Coin said that. I don't know who these people are. I'm just reading these quotes. <laughs> but some of them I may know. Love myself I do. Not everything, but I love the good as well as the bad. I love my crazy lifestyle and I love my hard discipline. I love my freedom of speech and the way my eyes get dark when I'm tired. I love that I have learned to trust people with my heart even if it will get broken. I am proud of everything that I am and will become. Johnny uh, Veer, W-E-I-R. That was a nice one. So this one is from a man named Africa Bambata. And I think it's gonna be an epic quote. He says, what does he say? Okay, he says the universal Zulu nation stands to acknowledge wisdom, understanding freedom under uh, stands at, uh, the universal Zulu nation stands to acknowledge wisdom, understanding, freedom, justice, and equality, peace, unity, love, and having fun, work, overcoming the negative through the positive, science, mathematics, faith, 
facts and the wonders of God, whether we call him Allah, Jehovah, Yahweh, or Yah. So pretty much it's a yes man situation. The next quote is from Thomas Jefferson. He says, our greatest happiness does not depend on the condition of life in which chance has placed us, but is always the result of a good conscience, good health, occupation, and freedom in all, in all just pursuits. All right, that's, that definitely sounds presidential. Woodrow Wilson says, liberty has never come from government. Liberty has always come from the subjects of it. The history of liberty is a history of limitations of governmental power, not the increase of it. Okay. <laughs> so if I was to say something to Woodrow Wilson, I would say... Anyways, guys, I don't know. For me, government, governmental power is like him using that word is a bit ignorant. Uh, anyways, uh, Winston Churchill says, all, all the great things are simple and many can be expressed in a single word. Freedom, justice, honor, duty, mercy, hope. Jim Morrison says, friends can help each other. A true friend is someone who lets you have total freedom to be yourself and especially to feel or not or not feel whatever you happen to be feeling at that moment is fine with them that's what really that's what real love amounts to letting a person be what he really is wow that's what real love amounts to letting a person be what he really is this man just hit a home run <laughs> Um, Ronald Reagan says freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. Wow. He says freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Yeah, he's seeing the... I like his attitude here. The next one is from Hans Christian Andersen. Just living is not enough. One must have sunshine, freedom, and a little flower. That's dope. <laughs> um, the next one is from Soledad O'Brien. I've learned that fear limits you and your vision. It serves as binders to what may be just a few steps down the road for you. The journey is valuable, but believing in your talents, your abilities, and your self-worth can empower you to walk down an even brighter path, transforming fear into freedom. How great is that? Benjamin Franklin says, without freedom of thought, there can be no such thing as wisdom and no such thing as public liberty without freedom of speech. W dot E dot B dot D U space B O I S W E B D Du <laughs> He says I believe in liberty for all men, the space to stretch their arms and their souls, the right to breathe and the right to vote, the freedom to choose their friends, enjoy the sunshine, and ride on the railroads, uncursed by color, thinking, dreaming, working as they will in a kingdom of beauty and love. True success, true happiness lies in freedom and fulfillment. Oh, sorry, uh, that one's from Dada Waswani. Victor E. Frankel says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. That's, like, perfect. Exactly. Literally, in that moment of observance of phenomena, before it emerges, are where you are putting the boundaries of the reality. Malcolm X says, nobody can give you freedom. Nobody can give you equality or justice or anything. If you're a man, you take it. I mean, that's true. Like, you can't argue against that, but at the same time, 
how intensely do you mean take? Because the concept of take could be just like a, a, a like the hatred of man can suddenly become animalistic. Uh, you get sucked into, you devolve into your animalistic behavior if you're cruel for too long. I'm not joking. Literally, you can't be human to yourself anymore because your behavior is inhumane. What that means is like uh, the mind has to have a sort of attention to a reference point of what it's considering its order to be that means regardless of the good guy and the bad guy like <clears throat> why does the bad guy the super villain fights the super you know the super villain doesn't go like punch like someone in a coffee shop you know what i mean <laughs> like the super villain is like some person who in some sense is challenging the order of the universe and the order the superhero is the order challenging the chaos so in some manner, a lot of mythologies have come into just our history because in some sense of from order, chaos came. That means like order suddenly saw chaos and it was like the roar of chaos. Uh, the hands of all order had to hold the jaws of chaos like a lion, you know. So it's kind of one of those situations where reality had to instantly respond. In that instant responsibility, it had to make a decision. In that decision, it had to be a shape. It, ch it chose to be a shape in an intense situation it could have just been a climate like a climate of uh, a climate related issue what that means is our evolution had to do more with the climate do you see there's something divine about the air too it, it, you know it's so divine that without it it's like oh we can't breathe you know In ancient times, they believed God is air. In modern times, they believe God is as thin as air. The mind has opened up to various layers. Like, imagine it like this. Every day you have lived on this planet, you have literally just decided to act upon your intelligence. And as you have decided to act upon your intelligence, there has been a sort of pattern like imagine like every night before you sleep it's like you're sleeping with the pattern of the whole day accessible right so when i before i sleep every night i kind of wonder about the whole day and i try to think if there were any sort of treasures i had to reveal before i close my eyes for that day because when you close your eyes at night you're closing your eyes to like the reality you're trusting the void and sleeping you know <laughs> The Yoga Patanjali Sutras, these ancient Vedic texts, they say that the consciousness of the person is like a glass orb. And what that means is like a glass orb moving through various colors of cloth. That means literally you are just this attribute, little moment of being, you're your whole moment, you're not just your body, you're all that is aware as it, as it is. This instantaneous aware and awareness is a state called Satchit Ananda. What that means is you have become aware that you are conscious and this consciousness exists. And that is a sort of ultimatum, strangely. It's as if instantly the mind of man has been liberated from fear on the fear of death because it's like there was no longer fear when there was no longer death. death is something where it's just an opportunity it's just we are all bursts of energy our conscious divinity is how much we direct it where it goes where your the energy of your life literally is walking to <laughs> it's as if they went to the sage and i'm telling you any sage in the world could have said this sentence and any person asked them a question would know they're like that would they would be convinced the guy's a sage And the guy would, in some sense, come to the sage, ask some deeply met metaphysical question. And the sage would always say, who is asking? 
And what that means is, to be honest, true wisdom is true self-reflection. And the whole point of self-reflection is wondering what is this reflection in the mirror of this material simulation of phenomena. And so we have to take a new approach to the self. What I'm saying is don't believe anything anyone has told you. Don't even believe what you think that you are right now because thoughts change. You are not your thoughts. This is kind of like Mr. Within's kind of bold stance on, th on these things. What I mean by that is that life is... <sighs> it's like the soul of the world is like how the wind has a direction, but in some sense it's not here. Eventually, uh, from a cellular level, if we were like some uh, evolutionary biologist wondering, we will eventually come to an accidental position. We will eventually come to a point where literally the way we have documented history cannot capture that paradigm of how that intelligence was present. You see, it's like just like how imagine there was like a alien spacecraft suddenly like fell in New York or something and people saw it, right? like that same level of awe imagine there's certain thoughts and ideology and certain ways that the world can be seen certain hidden viewpoints left for the pilots of consciousness and the advanced communicators to in some sense open up and unravel it is kind of like how carl Jung said unless you make the unconscious conscious it will dictate your life and you will call it fate Again, this, this paradigm that as we choose to wonder about the unknown, it's kind of like this force field you touch. And when you touch the ripples on that force field is how your mind is conceiving the world. What that means is eventually if pure responsibility arrives from true uh, questioning and curiosity.
in the um, sorry guys I gotta say this one last thing and end off in the presence of attention the moment is its own existence so the approach no longer comes from a character who has a purpose or some sort of ambition you your mind suddenly detaches from this notion of the future it doesn't mean the future you can't consider the future you could do it anytime what i'm saying like it's like literally for a second you just forget about the future and you wonder where now is and when you look at how now is here you look at the, also the word nowhere and you see it's like pretty pretty much the same nowhere is just how now is here <laughs> and so it, it's kind of very interesting like It's a shame. Our civilization is, um, our, our intelligence is far beyond um, the current dimensions of, like civilization is not up to date. The human being is experiencing a, a kind of level of life where if the civilization reoriented to the efficiency of, of the citizen, Literally imagine the child was born and when the child had certain suffering, it looked at its civilization and he's like, I'm a member of civilization, assist me, you know, like the, the children are kind of shouted. And then in that moment, suddenly the civilization came to them and understood the situation and it, based on the most kind of just by this one ideal that life must be preserved and protected and freedom of the decency of the mind of human beings should be preserved. That means it's, I think it's very important that um, we, we create a generation of children who dare to see much further than we ever did. What I mean by that is like a sort of, we, we, we decide what continues in the attention of humanity. There's this quote that says, live for life and you will live for life. rather than a sort of destination truth doesn't become a destination truth becomes as Matsuyo Basho says this Japanese ambassador the journey itself is my own you become a journeyer in which your intelligence is is kind of like um, uh, dancing between the known and the unknown as life moves on based on the nature of your elemental existence, based on the nature of even the kind of food you consume, based on the nature of kind of how your mind kind of is introduced to the world, how life emerges for you, how much you choose to be a, a sort of design and structure of the subjective layout of how the moment could be. Thoughts come and go primarily. So when I speak to you guys, like I'm, I'm trying to make these kind of like, I'm trying to kind of like, I'm trying to look at language in, in a new light only to realize that language exists because of life. And that makes you suddenly realize that it's like before you care about your linguistic existence, it's kind of like your solar light oriented existence. So there's something incredibly divine of how so many people, their ancestors kind of faded in history and you are somehow here. So there's a value. It's like regardless of how much society comprehends like uh, who you are behind your eyes as a person, as a citizen. Because we have to care to kind of evolve this, uh, the setting. Either the character in the story must change or the setting must change. And Mr. Within is saying, if we're smart, we'll make the setting uh, want to make the character change in the greatest way. And what that means is we attempt, we say, what if we could make the dreams of the person come true? If in doing so, the person found a, 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 a sort of genius pathway to recontribute uh, re to civilization. Do you see, it's about opening people's minds, not closing... Uh, life into a box of words.
and a society beyond language, what would it look like? It would pretty much look like a society where we realize it's like, even when we had language, we also had silence. And there is a beauty to silence. There is a beauty to the, on the silence of honesty. There is something divine about it, I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Much blessings and all say.